So last time you saw me make some tool holders for the mill, I thought it seemed fitting to follow up with some tool holders for the lathe. Now, although it is true that you can never have enough quick change tool post holders for your lathe, they weren't really very high up on my list. I mean, three or four more for now would certainly be convenient, but I was actually out looking for steel for the overarm support on the milling machine. I found this nice piece. They cut off a chunk for me. That's not to scale, but this will become the probably the next video in the overarm support for the mill. And while I was digging around for that material, I found this nice two foot piece of, I think this is a 1040, a C40. That's just the right size to get some more holders out of. So I figured, what the heck, no time like the present. So really the first step in making your own tool post holders is having a tool post with easy geometry. And in this case, it's really just a dovetail down the back. We'll take a look at my tool post in a minute and I'll share maybe some other options you might have if you have a more complicated tool holder. Some of them have a lot of, you know, T-slots and weird angles and not as straightforward of a mounting feature as this one might have. But anyway, I've already cut a piece off. This is about 11 inches. I plan to do the dovetails, the backside, and generally square up the block in the shaper. So here I can knock out one whole long dovetail and then chop it to pieces. I should get about four out of here maybe five depending what tools I end up building these for. So here's my quick change tool post. It's an Impero, Impero, it's Italian. I think it's Italian anyway. And next to it is the original Colchester four-way tool post that I got with the machine. Now at first they maybe don't look too different size-wise, but if this were smaller, it would have been a lot better fit for this machine. By the time you get a tool on here, the overhang from center I don't know, it's maybe two inches, two and a quarter inches, whereas here it's more like an inch or so. This is just a simple sliding dovetail. And geometry like this goes a long way to helping me make my own holders. And then the only real difference between mine and the store-bought is I have a much simpler height adjust. They have this really slick locking sort of height adjuster. You can adjust it and lock it in place and it's very convenient. But I've just got a socket head cap screw with a large knurled flange pressed on it and a jam nut underneath. Once you have enough of these tool holders with dedicated tools in them, there is not a lot of very much fussing around at all with the height adjustment. Now I wanted to show you a couple of things, a couple of different tool holders or different ways to get sort of to the same result. If you do happen to have tool holders that maybe aren't as easy to make as this. If you take a good look at, let's call it maybe your more sophisticated tool holder, there may be a way to build up the geometry using simpler shapes. So in this case, I have just dovetails cut right off of the saw that are plug, there's a plug weld through it and to a relieved body. So if you have fancy uh, T-slots or diamond-shaped slots, you may be able to build up the parts independently just to make your life a whole lot easier. Or you can use sort of the two-pin trick. I'm sure you guys have probably seen this before. It's just a couple of pins, you know, at the right distance to sort of mimic the dovetail locking geometry. Now this isn't going to have as much holding force as sort of a fully built formal dovetail. I mean, this isn't even a tool holder. I think at some point I was, I, I, I don't remember what I was going to do with this thing. Probably some kind of indicator holder or who knows what. And that more or less works, you know, just as well. So over time I've built up, I don't know, it's maybe a dozen or so, 14, 15 tool holders. But you can see there's still quite a few tools kind of up in the queue here that come out eh, relatively often often enough to make me want to make a, a tool holder or two more. Anyway, enough screwing around. Let's get to cutting some steel. So I'm set up in the shaper. The stock is really rough sawn, so I just sort of eyeballed it. I don't even want to use the word square, but just so I'm taking off the least amount of material necessary to start to develop a first reference surface. This is a 12 inch shaper and that workpiece is 11 inches long. 
that's sort of the integral number of tool holders I could fit in that length. If it was a 20 inch shaper, I'd probably be making more tool holders. The tool is nothing special, just some high speed steel that's a right hand and a left hand guide on the other side so I can turn this around and come from either direction. I don't really need a mirror finish here so I'm not going with anything fancy. First pass I'm hoping to do relatively quickly, maybe 10 or 20 thou depth of cut and a high step over just to identify any high spots or if I'm drastically out of plane somewhere. A yeah, roughing pass, basically. Alright, so that cleaned up pretty good. This is actually the second pass though. Halfway through that first pass I realized I had my work too deep in the vise and I wouldn't be able to cut the dovetail. Ideally here this is all done in one setup so everything is parallel and square, at least all the features on the back side. So I picked it up on some parallels, I have enough room to cut the dovetails and ran that second pass. I've scratched in the dovetail geometry so I can rough out to these lines and then come back, take some measurements, and finish up all the cuts. Alright, so I've got both shoulders roughed out. Now in order to set up both for the dovetail and to get the flats to final dimension, I'm going to come back through here with a finishing tool and just clean up the top of this, the back of the dovetail. It's not really critical to the function, but I'm going to use that as my reference surface to measure both these shoulders and the dovetail. Well, to measure the two shoulders and then use those to measure the dovetail. You know, I think I'd be hard pressed to explain why I like the Shaper. I mean, it's certainly not the fastest thing in the world. It certainly comes into its own doing things like slotting and keyways and like form tools, what we're going to see in a minute, cutting the dovetails. There's just something magical about them. It's like watching a campfire. And other than in the bathroom, I think this is the only other piece of equipment I can use sitting down. Alright, so that's our first reference surface. And I'm about 10 or 11 thou higher on the right hand side here. I'm going to set up for the dovetail cutter, use the dovetail cutter to rough out the dovetail and then pull my way out on both sides, trying to take these both to the same exact height. I'm actually using the dovetail cutter as a spacer and that's it there. It's a two-sided tool. So you're going to do left and right hand side. And there's nothing really magic to these there. The included angle is less than the dovetail that I want to cut. So I don't recall what it is in this case and it looks like they're probably not even the same. But the dovetails need to be 60 degrees so these are probably 50. Somewhere between 45 and 50. And that's just so it gives me enough clearance to walk in and move the tool around with I guess the top slide to generate that 60 degree angle and not foul on either side of that. As opposed to say a dovetail cutter in the milling machine that pretty much needs to be exactly the same angle as your dovetail and it's sort of cutting, well at least on one face, completely along its length. I'm 
And so I've swung the top slide over to about 60 degrees according to its scale. And now I'm going to use a reference plate and a dial indicator on a mag base to tune that in. And one of these never hurts. All right, I'm happy with that. It's about two thou over, I don't know, an inch, inch and a half of travel. My dovetails are only a quarter inch and it's, I mean, it's a quick change tool post holder. The only other thing I'd like to change is this clapper box angle. So the top slide is set to 60, but the clapper could be set anywhere with respect to that. And then the last thing to check is the tool orientation in the tool post. All right, that way we've got some clearance in the heel and the tool's already been ground tighter than 60, so there should be clearance with the ceiling once we get it under there. Now this is gonna be all manual operation with the top slide and the x-axis. I'm just going to sort of nibble away till I get close, lock all the other axes except the top slide and clean up that cut. I'm going to establish this dovetail first and then we'll get into dovetail measurements and setting the location of the other side. All right, well that's one side cleaned up and taken to size. So now I'm gonna basically flip the whole setup, indicate the top slide in like before, and work in the other side. The dovetail's roughed in, both shoulders are to size. I'm not going to touch these flats anymore. I'm just going to keep moving that dovetail in until I match the dovetail of a functional holder. And to size the dovetail, I'm just going to measure across a couple of pins. Now with the pins, it's a bit of a Goldilocks situation. Not too big, not too small. If the diameter is, you know, such that you're hitting about halfway up the dovetail, that should be fine. So I'm about exactly 2.4 inches, uh, 61 millimeters. It might be a thou or two over that. Now a dovetail measurement is usually a job for a micrometer, but again in this case, the way the dovetails are working in the quick change tool post, I've got a fair bit of margin you know, with a sliding dovetail on the quick change tool post holder. So it looks like I'm almost a millimeter over, almost 40 thou, that's 25, yeah almost maybe 35. I'm just going to keep moving this left-hand side dovetail in until I match the dovetail dimensions to the known good holder. All right, that looks like I'm within a couple of thou. I think I'll just run with that. Fingers crossed. All right, let's give it a try. All right, I'm happy with that fit. I can keep going. So I've got it flipped now in the vise, dovetail side down. I'm just gonna clean up the back and chamfer the corners now that I've got them all sort of ganged up together instead of chamfering them individually once they get cut off. I'm not sure how much I'll show of this, but it's more or less more of the same. See you in a minute. 
I got the back cleaned up. I ended up not cutting the chamfers because it turns out this block's a little wider than I need. So I'll take it to width and then cut the chamfers in the mill. And I picked out a few tools that I'd like to make holders for. It's not necessarily these tools, but this size at any rate. Most of these happen to be right hand tools that I usually don't keep handy loaded in a tool holder. But anyway, I definitely want to make a new holder for the parting and grooving blade. This is just a Char's, I don't know, three inch. And you can see it's sort of a holder inside of a holder. I'm just going to replicate the Char's holder geometry in the tool post holder and just get rid of this extra part. Anyway, the moral of the story here is the tools aren't as big as some of the other tools, so I might be able to get five pieces out of here. I'm just going to measure them out and cut them off. Now, other than the dovetail fit, there's nothing really critical about these. One feature I do want to get in there right is this cutout for the tool holder. In my case, I'd like that slot to be perpendicular to the dovetail, just so I'm not screwing with any of the geometry of my insert tooling. But of course, you can make sort of these front features anything you need. You could cut this, for example, at a 5 or 10 degree angle for high speed steel and already give it that top rake so it saves you some grinding. Now there's a few ways to get that perpendicularity, but I think what I'm going to do in my particular case is mount the holders in a second vise with the pins. That way I can square this face up, and when I rotate it I know it's perpendicular to the dovetails. And I could have skipped the second vise and just rotated my machine vise 90 degrees, indicated that in, and cut the slot directly. Or do the same thing and cut the slot with my y-axis, but I'd prefer to do this with power feed which I only have left and right and up and down. So there it is, and now the dovetail should be square to one face. So we've got two reference faces perpendicular to each other and square to the dovetail, and now it's just like squaring up any other block. All the blocks are nice and square now. You probably can't see it, but I've got a couple of scribe lines. Now I just want to rough out where the tool goes. I'll be honest, I thought about doing the overarm support first, just so I had an excuse to try one of these guys out. That would have been interesting to see how well that did at clearing that slot out. But for now, I'm just going to go with a rougher. So that's pretty much at depth, 20 thou away according to the DRO. I'm just going to step over and work to the scribed lines. Alright, that's starting to look the part. I was going to go in there with a finish cutter, but I think that should be perfect for a tool holder. Three or four more to go and I'll come back and drill some holes. So as luck would have it, probably less than two or three weeks ago, I came across a tapping head. 
I think it was a new old stock sort of situation. Guy said he'd give it to me for 30 bucks with whatever it had in it. No guarantees and no returns. And it came with a couple of plastic collets. Well, three of them. There's one in there now. And to be honest, I only have tried it once when I first brought it home. I put it in the lathe. It seemed to work okay. And faced with, you know, 20, 30 odd tapped holes ahead of me, I really wanted to figure this thing out. Now, I'm not positive, but I think this is uh, Spanish. It might be French. I put it in Google Translate, and this translates to um, Go For It, Tony. And it was right. It's, it's working out. Now, this thing does not, it's not an auto reverse. And on top of that, when I reverse the rotation of the spindle on this mill, it does not reverse the direction of the table power feed. So I've got to throw two levers at once. There's no quill here, and I've set the machine up so the table is raising and backing away as close as I could get to the pitch times the RPM, the feed rate of the, the cutting thread. Pucker factor was high on the first one, but I'm slowly building confidence here. last part I need to make is this little knurled like thumb screw for the height adjust. I'm going to need five of them. I'm just going to do a straight knurl across, drill it through, part them off, and I'll press them onto the screws. All right, so that pretty much does it for the tool holders. The only thing left to do, or I like to do, as I mentioned in the other tooling video, is to cold blue them. Now, I got a lot more interest than I expected. I didn't expect any, to be honest, on the cold blue in the last tooling videos. So this time, I thought maybe I'd talk through it a bit more. I usually buy the cheapest blue that I can find. And in fact, this last batch just showed up in... A drinking water bottle. This was an eBay buy. I guess somebody makes this, fills bottles, and sells it on eBay. But as you can see, I'm out of that stuff, and I picked up this Philips Professional Cold Blue. Now, if you're looking for it, just search for Cold Blue, and you'll usually find, I mean, I think it's meant for firearms, uh, little touch-ups. You wouldn't want to do probably a whole gun. And certainly also have a look around. I know uh, Mr. Pete just did a really good bluing video. He did this cold blue stuff and heat blue, like an oxide blue. I'd call those rather exhaustive, so certainly if you're interested, have a look at that one. And while you're at it, be sure to watch his other 6,000 videos. Anyway, this Phillips stuff recommends 3 to 1 mix. So 3 parts water, 1 part blue. There's no ingredients on this bottle, but it's my understanding that this is selenium dioxide, if you're wondering what's in here. So probably the most important step before hitting it with the cold blue is cleaning the parts. I'm going to do that off camera, but I'm just going to scrub them down and wash them down a bit with some acetone. Now the other big thing to get really good results with this stuff is a good surface finish. So the higher the polish, the better the cold blue tends to turn out. As I mentioned before, I'm not too worried about the aesthetics in this case. It's more for corrosion resistance. But what I did was I went ahead and I ground one of these. If you can see that on camera. This one is a ground finish. I did the top and the front. And the others are just right off of the mill. And we'll compare those once we've blued them. Alright, so that's 100 ml of this Phillips stuff. I'm going to try it according to the instructions. I've, again, I've never used this, but to be honest, I don't trust it. I've usually had to go to like a one-to-one -one mix to get really good, good-looking blue. But we'll try three-to-one. Hey. 
and you just drop the part in. It usually doesn't take very long. It's been in there five minutes. I'd probably leave it another five, but I found what helps is once it's sort of halfway started to turn, I get some really fine steel wool and just rub down the surfaces. So these have been in here about, I don't know, 20 minutes. I'm not that impressed. I did up the concentration to a two to one. So one part Phillips, two part water. I just added it right to this soup here. I don't know, it's like a nice gun metal, I suppose, but it's not really black. I think if I pick up this stuff again, I'd probably choose it straight out of the bottle. I'll see what they look like oiled up. Put a couple more in here. And I'll throw the hardware. This is just some light three-in-one oil, basically. Now, from what I understand, the cold blue, the selenium dioxide, creates a very, like a porous oxide layer. And the oil is really what does the corrosion resistance. It sort of permeates into that porous layer, kind of like oil in a sintered bronze bearing, if you know what I mean. All right, well, not overly impressed with how this stuff is working out. Here are two oiled blocks with the Phillips. This is one that I haven't even done yet. It's hard to even tell the difference. Compare that to the black from the mill tooling. I think I'm going to try some of this Phillips stuff just straight out of the bottle. All right, here's some straight blue, not watered down. And this, uh, you may recall, I didn't have a vice handle for the little ROM vice I have on the milling machine. This was a fun little project. I'm going to try to blue this with the straight 100% concentrate. So I don't have a container big enough for this vice handle. I'm not worried about it coming out splotchy because I'm pretty sure it'll still work. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's better than before. I'm sure there's gunsmiths out there right now watching this, probably tearing their hair out. I'll tell you what, all told, they didn't turn out too bad. It's not as dark, maybe as rich as the stuff I've used before this, but it's got this nice, uh, I don't know, like a lead gray, a gunmetal gray going on. Looks fancy even. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see the difference between the ground one on the right and the milled one on the left. Looks really sharp. Nothing left to do but put them to work. Thank you.